Sada, sada, sada. We seem to be waiting. Waiting and waiting and waiting for something. Something that we never take the time of day to sit and delineate the edges of to understand its dimensions to understand what it might be this thing and usually this waiting process involves the need to jump away from this moment in a different trajectory than this present, than this now, than what is occurring in the mind, in the body. Meanwhile, the storylines are playing in the background, the narratives are nonstop. Every gesture of the mind is precious. Every thought, feeling is precious. but precious in the sense that there's something there for us to use. To start fleshing out, to start understanding the different dimensions, the shape of what it is. that we are dealing with, this thing that we seem to not even be able to touch. The Buddha was able to touch it to make it tangible, the sense of flavorless, colorless thing. That seems to evade us constantly and he called it Dukkha, suffering. So every thought, every feeling, comes to add more color to this thing, more dimension to this sense of dis-ease, this tension that we keep trying to evade, push away, and wait it out, in a sense. Things will be better in the next moment. As I push this thought, push this discomfort away, push this 
year away. Today being the first of our virtual retreats of this year, 2021. I was thinking what theme should I approach to help bring about a sense of immediacy, urgency to the practice. The year, like many others before it, is just a number, and it's a made-up number. Society has given it to us. Our cultures have brought it to us. There's different ones. Which one are we going to stick to anyhow? But every moment, there's something precious coming into our purview, something really valuable. Even if it's painful, even if it's disconcerting, even if it's unappealing or pleasant or pleasurable, what are we doing with it? This work requires a certain sense of finesse, a certain level of finesse. Of being delicate. Of being soft, but sharp. Soft, but sharp. It has a certain elegance to it. But the mind has to first calm its gushing waters, these waves, these tumultuous thunderstorms. These high highs and low lows that it goes through. And that is why we practice to sit, to meditate. And yes, sitting meditation is crucial, but it's not everything, but it needs to be regular, daily. It's preparing the mind to calm those heavy waves, soothing them, soothing them, comforting them. And for that, we need patience, tolerance, like a loving parent. We need to parent our mind. Just like a loving parent treats each and every one of their children, no matter how many, they treat them with love. If they're the loving, caring type of a empathic, understanding, mature, loving kind of a parent, They will, they will treat each one of their children in a precious way. So my invitation to you 
today, today, in, in this new year, is to try and see if we can treat each moment of experience with an attitude that treats them as if they were precious. Now, of course, this does not negate the important position of understanding between what is wholesome and what is not. That goes without saying. But even the unwholesome thoughts, the unwholesome feelings, they're presenting us with something valuable. It's fuel for further progress, to delve deeper into understanding ourselves and to add more dimension. Remember, awakening is nothing if not a very deep level of understanding. And that's unprecedented for the person. So it's not some psychic trance-like states that we're looking for when we talk about Nibbana, some higher than thou type of a state. No, it's nonsense. It's a unprecedented level of wisdom Wisdom in action, wisdom in stillness. And that's why mindfulness and clear understanding, clear comprehension have to be there. But if we don't have the attitude of a loving, caring parent, what happens is that even mindfulness turns into some type of a policing our thoughts, policing our sensations, like holding the baton in our hands and just like, you know, waiting for us to do some mistakes or don't you dare draw outside the lines or color outside the lines type of an attitude. And that is something that I've noticed with some meditators, it obviously it brings about a sense of rigidity. So now they're rigid. So there's no balance. Key thing, therefore, is always to remain soft, malleable, but sharp, deliberate. That's why mindfulness needs to be balanced with wisdom, which is sampajanya, sati and sampajanya. That will never change, even in an arahant, from what I read in the suttas. So let this year be a fun year, where instead of using the outside trajectory away from us, from whatever is happening now, bringing the focus and attention to the here, but without a sense of shame, a sense of discomfort within ourselves, of pushing away, of trying to add something, of not being enough, not being enough and trying to add a layer of Dhamma on ourselves so that it becomes a nicer, more palatable presence for us to tolerate this thing, this person that we look at and see in the mirror. I've explained in the past to students how the jhanas, for example, the deep le levels of understanding, these comfortable, relaxing and rejuvenating states, stations, way stations, need not to be looked at as an addition. And even later on, 
becoming any of uh, getting to the to those any of those stages of attainments once non um, stream enterer once returner non returner or even an arahant they're not additions on top of ourselves i've noticed many people on retreats come in and wanting to attain But when you take that outside out of the equation and just have them spend a moment with themselves, looking at themselves, there's just disgust, intolerable presence that they want to move, push aside from. So the Dhamma is not a, a, a lid that covers something, or it's not another layer that gets to be added upon this protoplasm of disgust that we have, that we're trying to evade, escape from. So there's no escape as such in this practice. There's an unlayering. There's a removal and seeing things for what they are type of an attitude throughout. And that is what brings us to a mindset where we can start to look at our thoughts as precious, our feelings as precious. So long as we're looking at them with the eyes of Sati and Sampajanya. So there's this sense of acceptance Never have I seen in any of the suttas, any of the verses, vaggas, anywhere, where a person comes to the Buddha and the Buddha is very, you know, standoffish or pushing them away or something. And there's an acceptance. Even those who came to try to insult him or accuse him of something, he held the space for that moment. There was a level of, let's sit with this. Makes you want to breathe deeper, just having that image in mind. So in other words, I'm inviting us to Breathe, breathe deeper with our thoughts, our feelings, and especially with our tolerance of ourselves. And looking at the Dhamma and looking at the practice, not in some compulsory way, deep, subtle, compulsory way attitude, where it's, a, where it's, a, it's like a half-to tone and flavor to it, which can be disgusting eventually. Instead, to be curious, to be lovingly waiting and accepting as to what this thought is teaching me, what this moment of tension is teaching me, what this, what this sensation in my body, this in my gut, this knot in my throat teaching me. And just allow it to just allow that space not to go on pondering and thinking. So there's a sense of freedom. And that's why freedom belongs to heroes, to the brave, the brave who doesn't run from anything. stays in this present, whatever is happening, solid, but fluid, <laughs> soft, but sharp. So I will offer that to you for this morning's 
uh, sit and, and open for any thoughts and comments you might have. First of all, I just want to uh, thank Greg for <laughs> making me buy the first toy for myself. I <laughs> 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 call it the gun rescue. Um, and I just have, a, again, a very basic question. Why sitting? Why sitting meditation? Why can it? Why, why not standing meditation? Why is the sitting so important? Well, um, sitting, not to be spending your whole time meditating, sitting. I mentioned how the sitting part is required, um, but that's not all. So you might sit maybe for half an hour or an hour or more a day. But that helps the mind to prepare. See, there is, we're creating potential energy, think of, think of it in those terms, versus kinetic. Most of the time we're involved in dynamic motions, dynamic movements. But we need to have the headquarter of the sitting meditation there. It's essential. Why and that might why... not be, uh, say, kneeling, for instance, or um, oh, like end up the posture. Why is this? Ah, I, I, I see. Yeah. So you're you're mentioning about the actual physical posture physical in relation to the sitting exactly. the type of sitting. Mm -hmm. That's fine. In in certain uh, Zen traditions, for example, I know there's in some cultures. I used to sit on my knees, but using one of those. Uh, chairs, uh, small um, shaved off at the edges type of a chair where you sit for Zen uh, sometimes. Uh, but that's, that's, part, that's perfectly okay. Um, I have known of someone who would sit for hours like that a day on retreat. Um, again, we need to be mindful and cognizant of the body and its limitations, meaning so long as it's not endangering the, 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 the person's health. I will never um, ask or demand of students to sit for such long hours that they will get blood clots. And you will get blood clots if you sit for long, especially if you're, you know, in the aging process, if you passed a certain age. Um, so yeah, that's fine if you're sitting on, on uh, you know, but some people in, uh, ask if they need to sit full lotus, half a lotus on a chair. Um, it doesn't matter as long as the person's body is comfortable. Remember, ultimately, it's the position of the mind, not the position of the body. Right. That takes the cake. Any other questions, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could ask. Uh, yes. Um, could you, could um, you turn your camera, please, Matthias? Yes, OK. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, hi. Oh. Oh. Um, and I don't know if I have a clear question, but I was wondering, like, uh, how, to, how to decide, like, what's a good decision in your life, mm -hmm. like, uh, in, everyday life and uh, where should you go like <laughs> a quite general question i suppose <laughs> yeah it's a practical question it's it's an important one i say mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion um, there's different uh, methods of uh, that i uh, suggest or recommend to clients or patients whenever they or even myself when i have to face some some issue like that and I can't seem to wrap my, like, what is the right direction to take? Um, get a piece of paper, I would say, and, and, and a pencil or a pen okay. and draw a line in between, like make two columns mm. and um, do a pro and con. On one column, just on top, write pro, the other one, con. Mm. 
pro, you know, what are the positives or what are the good things about this thing if I were to go in this direction, this decision, let's say, uh, whether it's this job or, or this activity, what are the benefits and list them and be fair. And I found it useful to also number them. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the other column, where it's the con section, where it's not a good idea, uh, or some of the, you know, the shortcomings of it, shall we say, the negative aspects of it. And write them down honestly, though, in both cases. Hmm. And then if you do have the luxury of time, put it away for a few hours hmm. and come back to it a few hours later, maybe in the afternoon, if you wrote it in the morning, and then look at it or in the evening, just look at it again. Sometimes you're going to get clearer images of, you know, whether it's an emotional decision that you want, like emotionally, you want to go ahead and just dedicate yourself to it. Um, so sometimes we need to be uh, very uh, alert and aware of these different factors that are playing in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's the fear. Mm -hmm. In in both cases, it could be the pro, the fear might cause us to go to the poor, uh, the pro column, or to the mm -hmm. negative cause column. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. Does that make? Do you think that might be useful for you in mm -hmm. your case? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so good yeah. to see that pros and cons. Yeah, yeah, and also asking um, uh, if you have individuals in your life or a person that you trust, um, that's like the second level of, of using the pros and cons list and, and discussing it with them as long as it's something that you can discuss and you feel comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. And hear their thoughts. That's at least going to save you the extra burden of possibly having other ulterior motives in the background of your mind versus mm -hmm. this person who's like, who has, has fresh eyes to look at the situation. Yeah. That's another way of... Mm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, KK. By the way, if you have any other suggestions for Matthias and, um, you know. I do. <laughs> That's exactly what I was uh, responding to that. Um, even though last week was just a, a kind of a, maybe a somewhat not to me as serious, but to others might be a bit facetious asking you about the scorpion. But what I realized is that um, it was very helpful for me, th that answer, because I realized how easy it is for us to rationalize decisions, say that it's a good decision, because um, actually I had the Scorpion discussion with, with Russell before, before asking you, and along with uh, two other students, because I didn't want to kill the Scorpion, <laughs> okay, so there was a Scorpion in the house, and then um, the students said, it's crazy, you know, it's a Scorpion, you, you just definitely should get rid of it, and then I say, okay, maybe that's true, because, you know, if I release it, it's going to hurt someone else, and so maybe that's my use of the wisdom, <laughs> right, so that's how I rationalize that, okay, let's kill the scorpion. But what you said last time is that what makes us feel that we have, uh, and, and then the rationalization is that it might hurt someone else. So it seems to be a good decision. But what you said last time was, uh, well, what makes us feel that human beings have a higher, whatever, you know, deserve a higher status. So what I want to say to Matthias is that it's really necessary to have someone else to bounce off ideas, someone who is like more better than you. Um, and I feel that you have such a high standard. So for us to think that, oh, we are doing a good act. Say I order my food from Costco, which comes in huge quantity. So I would always give it away uh, to neighbors and share with neighbors. And then I thought, wow, you know, that's being generous. But then I say, wait a minute, you know, do I always give away what is left? 
<laughs> like I have not used up as opposed to giving them the fresh thing. So after last week, I said, no, I'm going to give them the fresh stuff and then I'll use up the, the old stuff. So there's always room to, to be better, I feel. And then there's so much room for me to be better. So I want to thank you. That it's and easy to rationalizing that, oh, I'm doing a good thing when it's like really not such so good. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yes, also. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, in, uh, as far as what uh, Mateus was talking about, I, I learned something in uh, when I was uh, going to film school mm. and it's called sort of, st sort of storyboarding. Mm. So basically, you know, you look like, you look at a movie as a story and uh, well, I kind of look at, you know, life as a, as a movie too, as a story. So basically, if you divide uh, a decision into, you know, kind of three parts, intention, action, and consequence, then, uh, yeah, it seems a little bit simplistic, but sometimes it actually helps, like, all right, what, what, what's the motive here of the character, which mm -hmm. is yourself? Uh, what, 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 what kind of action or decision are you going to make? And kind of what's the consequence? Uh, what's the effect upon you or other characters in your story or in your life? And, you know, for many decisions uh, or for many actions, you know, if you actually kind of break it down into <clears throat> those three uh, things, motivation, action, and the consequence mm -hmm. or the effect, you know, uh, E-F-F-E-C-T, then... Um, in a way, you know, it makes it easier to analyze uh, what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, not all the time. Sometimes there's gray areas, mm -hmm. but by putting it on paper, as uh, Bonte suggested, it makes it pretty clear. Uh, <clears throat> like, for instance, uh, you know, what KK talked about, having the surplus of food uh, or any other kind of uh, decision uh, one has to make. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so anyway, that's kind of what I learned in film school mm -hmm. for looking at characters uh, within a script or in a movie. So just look at your life as a script, as a movie. And okay, what's this character who's going to be me? What are they going to do? Why? And what effect is it going to have on the story? Anyway, this, that's kind of a, just a more fun approach, you know. <clears throat> Since I live in Hollywood, so, you know, we're kind of surrounded by by actors. Okay. Right. Anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. I, I you just took me back many years when when I was studying film, and and that's brilliant. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, you know the intention and, and especially the consequence. All of a sudden, the decision that you were about to make that you were you know struggling with becomes a way for you to understand underlying tendencies about yourself. So it's no longer about the decision. So the decision itself becomes like the thought that I was mentioning earlier to be treated as a precious thing. The decision itself becomes precious because it churned and churned and all of a sudden you're seeing what was on the at the bottom of the bowl. You know, I was eating soup the other day and I was eating from the surface until I actually got the spoon to go deep enough into the bowl. And all of a sudden I was like, I lifted it up and it was, it, the spoon got a little bit heavier and I lifted it up and there was a piece of like juicy broccoli in there. And I was like, oh, you've been hiding from me. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have to churn it sometimes. We, we have, to, and these are beautiful, even though it's uncomfortable at times on the surface, to see, oh man, I have to make another decision. I have to do this, the pros and cons, or do these different three phases like Russell was saying. But there's so much juice there. There's so much discovery to be made that goes far beyond the limitations of this one particular decision. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. Does, does that, uh, is that helping you more, Matthias? Yes, uh, it's a very insightful and uh, good advice. Thank you. Yeah. 
Great, great. Mm -hmm. Yes, Namanina. I just had the uh, the sentence in my mind that intention is the engine of karma. So Russell's comment helped me be reminded of the fact that it is the engine of karma, you know, the driving force behind action. So it was a lovely reminder. Yes, Russell. Well, I don't, well if uh, intention is the engine of karma, don't don't put it on a BMW. It's very expensive to maintain, as people tell me. So, just you know, uh, <clears throat> keep keep your uh, <clears throat> keep one's uh, ambitions a little, you know, less uh, uh, whatever materialistic. So anyway, but thanks, Marina. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? In that case, let me ask a question. Might there be any challenges for you as you look on ahead to this new year? Um, something that obviously you can share here that you might feel somewhat unsure about how to tackle it, how to approach it, and whether the Dhamma could be helpful even, or in any way, to deal with it, to approach it. It doesn't have to be for the next 363 days left. It could be for today, it could be in the foreseeable future. Any situation where you think, yeah, but the Dhamma doesn't work here. Uh, venerable, hello. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just not. I'm not sharing my camera at the moment. It's I don't have the best setup available. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess like with like due to my wife being like pregnant, one of the things that's really like. Um, going to cause a problem is being exhausted <laughs> you know and because that's already happening now because she's not sleeping great and obviously neither am i now because of that but how, how do you even like begin to practice on keeping an uplifted mind when when you're exhausted basically and you've got to hold down a full-time job mm -hmm. like that you know like this like gentle like which approach which you so rightly like um like teach it's much more difficult when you're at the end of your fuse already, you know, it's a tiredness. Mm -hmm. um, I would, first of all, shelve the whole uplifted mind thing aside, just put it aside. Because okay. that's already putting an extra burden on oneself. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the real life is happening all around you. You're feeling the frustrations of your wife, your partner, yourself, which you're kind of pushing aside because you have to be a caring, loving partner, all these things. Meanwhile, in the background, the words come in, hey, I'm supposed to be having an uplifted mind. I'm supposed to be da 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 da, which puts you in not a comfortable state to say the least, right? So mm -hmm. the first thing I would say is just push, you know, put aside temporarily the uplifted mind or any other expectations of the sort and come and inhabit your body come back to what is happening mm -hmm. usually the most abundantly clear one the most pronounced um, might be the breath you might have actually held on to the breath meaning you're not breathing in and out your fists, your hand might have turned into so tight that they're formed into a fist. There might be tightness in the chest. And definitely your connection with the ground has been lost. So you're just floating. You're very heady in those uh, heavy moments that demand attention. 
Now, that's more reliable to me. That's more relatable to me to be in the presence of someone who is there and not telling me, oh, you need to calm down. Oh, you need to be this. Oh, let's do this. So you become more real. That's what I'm trying to say. So you deal with what is happening. Okay. And then you start to look at what are some of the things that you could do to assist instead of let's say um, feeling the pain and the discomfort through osmosis because your wife is feeling the difficulties in her body and all that she's unable to sleep uh, making room for that talking about it instead of assuming that this is what all expecting parents have to go through. So let's just suck it up and deal with it and push and push and push. Even if I can't sleep three nights in a row, so I should be a good dad to be a good mom to be and da, 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 da. That's not feasible. That's not reasonable, in fact. So communication is good. And if your wife, for example, has an um, extra set of responsibilities for that day, um, um, asking her if you could do some of it. Mm -hmm. And that gives her room to breathe, just mentally. She might say, no, 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 thank you, but no, I'm okay. And uh, physical touch helps, just holding the hand helps. Mm -hmm. um, looking at each other's eyes helps quietly like earlier I was saying about holding that space mm -hmm. because the other than the physiological things um, that are going on there's also the psycho emotional there's fear there's all these things that could be playing in the background so allowing room for these to come out and be verbally addressed. How do you think? Does this even like sound like? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely very like. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, like when you talked about like getting in touch with the body, uh, that that's probably the most grounding thing for me, even more so than the breath. So it's really helpful mm. because it's just immediately there, isn't it? And there's no expectation like from from yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. Greg, you had your hand up. Yeah, my two cents worth is I, when I have situations that are causing problems and stress, I like to try and put the situation into a totally different environment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I do that, it highlights the wrong thinking that I have or the craving and the clinging, etc. So when I was a younger person, I, well, I still am a runner, but I ran a few marathons and having the child the next year or several years is a little bit like running a marathon. We can't run the marathon without spending a certain amount of time doing it. We also have to put in a certain amount of effort to do it. And what during that time and while we're putting in that effort, there's going to be a certain amount of physical sensations, not all enjoyable, but we can choose to run the marathon or not. And once we start, we want to finish and having the child now that she's pregnant, there's you, you can't stop. So the, we, we've got to let go any craving and clinging that we have to a different outcome than we're experiencing. So, if we can use the six R's like we normally do about any of the stress and the suffering, relaxing our desire for something different and understanding that what we have is what we get in this situation, then a lot of the stress involved in the situation goes away. Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to be tired and it's not going to be an effort that you're going to have to put in, but it takes away the stress and that's what we're doing. Well, if we can remove the stress, then the rest of it is just life. I love that last sentence. 
If you remove yeah, the stress, then the rest of it is just life. I love it. Uh, thank you, Greg, for that. That's um, the expectations part is sometimes causing us extra unneeded strife. And expectations have to do with the, it's not just about the future, but it's also about the disappointments of the past. Have I been a good person? Have I done enough in the past? Did I screw up in the past? Will I be screwing up now? All these things come to add to, like Greg was saying, to life. And coming back to the, just the baseline, whether, whether you're using um, anchoring techniques like, like grounding yourself, starting with your feet, do you feel the ground underneath you? Do you feel the, the, the sleeves of your shirt, your, your body? Six Ring, recognizing, oh, my hands are tight. Oh, I'm clinging to something. There's so much tension in my head as if there's like three pound metal ball in, stuck in my brain. Are these things happening? And then by looking at the process of 6R, you release it, you relax it, you smile, you return back. And using the body as an object in this case works brilliantly, by the way. Even if metta at that point is not coming out, even if equanimity is not being sensed, Remember, we need to settle, soothe, and relax these heavy, heavy waves. And then when equanimity becomes stronger and stronger, these waves won't matter because they will come and go and you can, you're settled. And again, using this, like Matthias was saying with his uh, decision-making uh, uh, question, this is also obviously a precious moment, not just for one of you, but for both of you and for the child to be. So how, how do you find these suggestions coming your way, Chita? Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And it also feels um, very realistic and, and doable. Mm -hmm. So I really do appreciate like both of your advice. Thank you very much. And and like KK was saying, uh, you know, talking with someone who's already done it, who's gone through it, always helps. Instead of living within this boundary of our skull, our thinking, our this is my life type of a thing, there's other people who have gone through this uh, with more experience than ourselves can help tremendously. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any others? Chita, that um, I have gone through it and you're raising a kid and it was a really, really hard and stressful work. But if I look back, one thing I wish I'd done more is to enjoy rather than be stressed by the whole thing. Sometimes it's really just a change of attitude. You know, you just feel, hey, just enjoy having a kid as opposed to just, you know, thinking you have to do so much for the child, you know, just say, just to, to, to use that time. Okay, I'm glad we took Chisa is back. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, I felt compelled to share my word of the year, which you probably can see from your screen. Okay, um, it's uh, it's the Chinese uh, is probably uh, the closest Chinese word to sati in yeah. Sampajanya. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the top half of the word uh, uh, means here and now. And the bottom half um, 
Well, Bante, you might, yes, yeah, uh, you might recognize it's, it's the heart. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, it's the Chinese word that says um, your, um, okay, your, your mental conditions, your heart mm -hmm. as of uh, right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, well, I'm, I have chosen this word as my, um, as my meditation object this year to remind me um, to maintain sati and sampajanya. You can't go wrong. <laughs> You've picked a, a winning uh, combo, as they say. Um, that's beautiful. And thank you for sharing it with us. It's a, uh, you said you've chosen it, the, these, this, this twin. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us why? Share with us if you, if you feel like you can. Well, I suppose, uh, well, this is just to um, reinforce what uh, the rest of you have uh, just mentioned throughout um, this meeting. So uh, I think it's uh, what actually counts is the, um, the awareness, the constant awareness of what is going on in the chitta mm -hmm. at every moment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you are, uh, for example, if you, uh, if you think you're tired, which you probably are, okay, it probably, it, it's not stopping at the body. It definitely has a lot to do with the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, for example, if you have some important decisions to make, you probably, the, you, you probably want to consult your cheetah. You probably want to be aware of what is going on in in the mind, in the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it deserves the last word, your chitta. And from my experience, I know how there needs to be that sense of upekka so strong that the noise can quiet down on its own, but ultimately just one of my uh, teachers in the past uh, uh, encouraged me to do this actually. He said, when you're dealing with a tough, tough, a fork in the road type of a difficult question and you can't find an answer, ask, ask a very simple question. Is this the right thing? Or usually if the mind is calm, it's very quick, the answer. Sometimes you have to wait a little, but you have to let it go. You have to just pull your hands away from it. Ask the question, walk away and allow your heart to actually speak it. As you progress in this practice, in this particular practice of metta bhavana, your relationship with the Dhamma becomes especially relevant and related with the heart. And when I say heart, it's not just a physical heart. The Buddha used the word chitta, not just manas, manas. Manas is more of the logical, cognitive, etc. one would say. So he used it interchangeably. So as the practice develops, and you start parenting your mind, developing tolerance for yourself, acceptance, all of a sudden the mind opens up, chitta. And there's a beautiful saying, I've said it, uh, repeated it. Uh, these are not my words, of course. Um, 
One of my earlier teachers, Bhante Pumnaji, introduced me to it. And it's one of the phrases that the Buddha used for the experience of awakening. He says, Akupaceto vimutti. The unshakable serenity of mind, the unshakable liberation, freedom of the mind. Here, Chetu or Chitta are the same thing. So running the questions, the confusion even, taking a moment though, anchor yourself in the body and just take a moment and just run it through this channel of the heart. Let's see what it says. That's a, that's, that's a lovely uh, way to bring us back to that word, Upatissa. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's a self-discovery, folks. This thing is not about adding another layer, adding another layer. Some years ago, I, I, I was struggling with this feeling of, of what is this? What, what this? I was, you know, just like trying to add some more flesh to this and feel the dimensions and tangible, if it's tangible. And it suddenly it hit me with images. Like Russell, you know, you were saying about the image of the storyboards and movies. To me, the image of an elephant came in. It's like an elephant that doesn't feel okay being an elephant unless it puts on an elephant suit. It's as silly, as ridiculous as that. I was like, I just went and just did this to myself. Like, da. So let's not treat the Dhamma as another layer. I'm adding something to myself with this sitting, with this retreat, with this jhana, with this attainment or whatever. Instead, it's a discovery. It doesn't have those bells and whistles that the other one has, at least initially or initially, and then all of a sudden, it's nothing but. This was uh, really lovely. Um, any, any other thoughts, comments before we go close? Thank you all for um, sharing your valuable thoughts and suggestions to each other. This is, this is marvelous. I really love it. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all have experiences, tons of experiences, and we come from different angles, and it's a wealth. It's like adding more facets to the diamond. It's brilliant. All right, so let's do um, the dedication of merits. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition and achievement of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in these merits. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Be well. Again, Happy New Year. Conscious. Happy New Year. <laughs> year. As Upatissa said, with Sati and Sampajanya. Let's try to see if we can actually join in with Upatissa's permission. <laughs> Be well. Stay safe. Thank you, Daniel. Mm -hmm.